first person I'd like to talk to in our panel is Angie Bradbridge. Angie is the chair of Wine Communicators of Australia. It's a body whose members include journalists and winemakers, hospitality workers, retailers. Angie, are you comfortable with how the wine industry operates in its relationships with the media and retailers? No. Why? <clears throat> that was fairly... Uh, well, for a number of reasons, and I think that both Max and Mike have pointed them out. And the first one being around where the wine comes, how that connection and how the product that's reviewed or commented on actually gets into the hands of the reviewers. So unlike a scenario in the restaurant reviewing world where the publisher is paying the cost of the dinner and there's the, therefore the independence in that factor. And often the reviewer in restaurants goes in Unannou undercover. Unannounced and uncovered. In the wine industry, there's... Um, and, you know, it, it has propped up um, for many, many years this habit of sending all our new releases to journos, unsolicited, mind you. The journos aren't out there saying, send us all your new wines. Some are, most aren't. So that happens. And then most of the time, the visit to the winery, um, you know, that masterclass experience, whatever it is, is, a, is funded by the winery. And so the vast majority... And the, again... But what's wrong with that? Well, I think it creates this issue of fear that, that Max talked about before and this sort of like codependency that is that we now have but in that scenario. And I don't think the consumer or the reader of media in all its forms, whether that's traditional media or new media, understand that codependent relationship that now exists between wine producers and wine media. If the winery stops sending the product... The journos don't have anything to review. They have no content to put into their magazine, their paper, their website, their blog. And if the winery turns around and says, you know what, I'm a little bit um, tired of constantly, and this is the, a lot of the winery's faults, paying all this money to book a restaurant, to hire a masterclass and have go fantastic, I've got 20 people coming for four people to actually bother to turn up on the day then, you know, I think that's very unfair in the reverse. And so there... And those conversations can't be had. Because if the winery turns around and says, hey, you know what, I'm really a little bit annoyed and a little bit frustrated that I did all this effort and booked a plane for you yep. and paid for a plane ticket for you and you just didn't bother to turn up. So there's built-in complicity there. Well, there is. And what, what about... Can I ask about the retailing and advertising side and wine publishing? Now, Max and Mike have cited some examples there where a wine may be reviewed, and we'll be talking about this more in detail in a moment, but a wine may be reviewed alongside its ad in the same publication. And yet that disclosure between... The relationship between those two images is not disclosed. Does that concern you? Well, I think there's an issue of codependency there as well when you look at it and say that News Limited and Fairfax major advertisers that are left in their network and their stable are actually the retailers. Mm. And now there's a commercial partnership between Fairfax and Dan Murphy's around their reviews. And I don't for one minute put the wine reviewers of those publications into that. But I think it's an interesting publishing choice where that alignment's coming from. The bigger issue is that we also have retailers, um, particularly the big retailers, let's say Dan Murphy's, and whether it's through their Fine Wine Buyer's Guide or Vintage Sellers through Sellerpress, that are publishing magazines, glossy magazines, inserting them in papers, delivering them to your mailbox, giving them to you when you walk into the store, with their panel reviewing wine and putting all this content in there that is 100% funded by the wineries that feature in that publication. But can I ask you, do you ever get complaints from the public saying, we feel we've been deceived? No, and it's probably a little bit of the, you know, and this is an interesting conversation around Wine Communicators of Australia in its current format is a relatively young organisation. It came, it grew out of the state-based wine press clubs. And so now as this um, independent organisation that helps foster a better conversation about quality and standards and best practice in wine communication, we would have zero... We, we don't have any real face towards the consumer, so they wouldn't... Well, they don't do know now. That well, we do now. It's called Radio National. It's Radio National, and, and thank you for that. And, um, and, and I think that's an important part of our future, whether we are. But, yes, I do have conversations with wine writers about their concerns and their anxiety, which is, you know, conversations that Max and I have had. And we do have a lot of conversation with wine producers about what do we do? How do we change this paradigm? How do we change this codependency? And in some respects, thank you, social media, because now the wineries have an unparalleled opportunity to speak directly to their people, 
uh, their drinkers, the people that actually, at the end of the day, let's face it, keep us all in this industry. Well, thank you to social media here too, because I'm hoping that there's people in this room listening to this conversation who are madly tweeting and maybe Facebooking some of the comments and views that are being expressed. Please feel free if you are doing that. Keep it going. Uh, while we're talking about the ethics of what's going on here inside the industry, also on our panel today is Dr. Dennis Muller. Dennis has worked as a journalist for 27 years, including assistant editor at the Sydney Morning Herald and associate editor at The Age. Dr. Muller teaches media ethics at the Centre for Advancing Journalism, and his most recent publication is Journalism Ethics for the digital age, and it's a damn good read. Dennis, if you were editing a publication where Max Allen, Mike Benny and Philip Rich were working for you, what action would you take? It's a can of worms, isn't it, Michael? I, the first thing is I would require full disclosure to me as the editor. They don't need to publish these things, all of their financial details in the paper, but they need to disclose them to me in full. That was, in fact, the requirement at the age when I was associate editor there. I had to disclose my financial interest to the editor and it was understood that failure to do so was a sackable offence. So that would be my first step. So, in effect, Mike Benny would already be sacked? Well, no, no, no. no he's, he would be sacked if he didn't disclose. OK. Because okay. he, he did write anonymously an advertorial, yeah. which he's already admitted to. Well, he has, but if I, if I would need to know what his um, financial interests were in this area. Secondly, I would require that when they did publish a, a review, that there was a footnote saying that uh, Mike Benny or Max Allen uh, has whatever interests are relevant to, to the review. And thirdly, I've been listening to, with interest to the sort of embeddedness of these interests. And sometimes when the interests are so embedded, simple disclosure is not enough. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in those circumstances, I would be placing boundaries around what these guys could write about. Such as? Such as uh, what sort of brands or what sort of um, uh, companies or wineries or other interests that them, where the interest was so embedded that I couldn't be sure that they could, with the best will in the world, separate their private interests from their public duty. Now, for me, uh, we're relying on these people not for news, not for facts that, that the readers can, in a sense, assess for themselves, but we're relying on them for their expert opinion. Because isn't there a contract that these people have to filter a much wider world we don't really understand? Absolutely. And we can't see how they do that. That's all done in their heads. And they're not obliged to put in their commentary, their reasons for saying that, the, um, that this wine is better than that. They simply say it is because it tastes like this or something. So where we're relying on expert opinion or commentary, the, the, the contract, the duty, if you like, on the journalist for disclosure is heavier than it is in news coverage. Would you therefore say, just quickly, that from the scenarios that have been painted for you in this conversation so far, that this would constitute, in your eyes, unethical practice? It certainly would, and I would be deeply uncomfortable if I were editor of the Financial Review, deeply uncomfortable uh, with the situation that I've heard outlined today. Um, and it's not to do with the integrity of the individual, it's a matter of principle. And the other thing I've heard is that Max and Mike have come to two different conclusions mm. because there's no code. Well, a, a good job for the Wine Communicators Association would be to sit down and set out a code and though everyone would at least have some starting points. Can I get a show of hands here from the audience as to whether you think the issues we've been discussing actually matter? Do they matter to you? Can you raise your hand if they do? How many, keep your hand up if you've actually committed some of these ethical misdemeanors yourself. Are you prepared to say that? And there's five, six, seven, eight hands in the audience. Fantastic. That's great. All right, you're with RN First Bite. My name's Michael McKenzie, and in front of a live audience, a wine day out of Melbourne, we're asking if Australia's wine industry is just a little on the nose when it comes to relationships with media, advertising and retailers. And we're going to talk to a publisher in just a moment because, Max, I'm going to come back to you first. You had some concerns, as you've outlined, about the lack of disclosure to the public about who's doing what in wine writing, what's paid advertorial, and the pressure put on winemakers 
to sometimes help confuse the two. Because what I'm talking about here is a supplement that you've got here on the table that, if you wouldn't mind holding up to the audience, it comes with one of the most read wine magazines in Australia, which is James Halliday's Wine Companion. What's your issue with this supplement? Back in the old days, Michael, <laughs> if they ever existed really, there was a traditional boundary between editorial content and advertising content. Uh, and sometimes the advertising was, was attracted because of the favourable editorial content, but at least it was separated. This, I believe, is an example of that boundary blurring, uh, because as far as I can see, and I've poured over this, and correct me if I'm wrong, as far as I can see, the word advertorial does not appear on this supplement. On the front cover it says, Wow Factor Whites, 2014. Now, I know that this supplement was put together, effectively funded, through money paid by the wineries featured in the supplement. Uh, after the review and the score has been arrived at, that uh, the advertising department approach the wineries, they say, you have received this score and favourable review. If you pay a certain amount, which is, I believe, somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000, you get a full page to yourself uh, with the review and the score and a little bit of extra blurb about yourself and a lovely bottle shot. Now, we know that these things make a difference to sales. Um, that could change the, the revenue life of that particular wine for that winemaker, that, Absolutely. It? We know that high scores, talk to any winemaker and they will tell you that uh, regular scores in the 90s help build a brand. Mm -hmm. So if you're a winemaker and you're approaching a restaurant or a distributor and you say, I want you to distribute my wine, the, what, the first thing that the distributor or the re restaurant will do in many cases is look at your scores. Oh, 93, 94, 95. Wonderful, I'll take you on as, as... And then higher scores than that, 96 plus, absolutely have an impact on sales. We know this. So if you're in the company of other winemakers who've been favourably reviewed in that kind of score level by James Halliday in the supplement, that's great exposure. So let's take that to the publisher now. And joining us is our final person on the panel, and good on him for doing it as well. That's Simon McEwen. Simon's had 20 years' experience in publishing roles both here and in the UK, and he now heads up the consumer division of Hardy Grant Media, responsible for numerous mastheads, including the James Halliday Wine Companion. And Simon, why don't you disclose that the only reason these highly rated wines appear in the supplement is because the winemaker had to pay you to put them there? Can I just establish, is this, are you saying this is advertorial? Uh, I, I'm, saying, I'm saying it's advertorial, yep. um, but also I've seen an email from the advertising department to one winery concern okay. that explicitly calls it advertorial. All right, okay. Um, we do do advertorials in the magazine, um, in the latest issue, which is out now, and all good news agents and a lot of bad ones as well. And the, you um, can do that if you like, but at the same time, have you declared their advertorials in there? Yes, we declare their advertorials. So, so why we've got haven't a you them here? Why so, haven't you declared them on, in uh, this supplement? Because so, uh, the advertorial feature that we do for Semignon in here with the qualifying criteria is, have you got a bottle of Semignon and you can appear and the control of the article and the content is passed over to the advertiser within reason. With the supplement, we go to James with an idea of what the framework is and the specifications um, for the wines that we would like to feature. And then we get that from James's database. James supplies the wines to us, uh, the wine uh, reviews and tasting and, um, uh, um, and scores to us. And then we then approach the advertisers to see if they would like to promote in this supplement. You approach the winemakers? Uh, well, we, we approach the, the winemakers to see if they want to support this particular promotion. And if, they say, if they say we're not prepared to pay, for the sake of argument, $1,000 yes. uh, to put our rated wine by yep. James Halliday into your supplement, yep. it doesn't go in, does it? It doesn't go in, no. So that's but it still goes onto our database and it still can actually be promoted in a future issue of the magazine. It will still feature in the book. And also, if a winery's got a license, they can use the tasting note in their own promotional material. So there's no penalisation. And I suppose the other thing is you can't buy your way into this supplement. Once we've decided what the criteria is, you can't buy your way in. And I, th I think that's quite a clear distinction between advertorial well, and editorial. Well, can I, can I challenge you on that and say, well, in fact, you are buying your way in. Because once you've been judged as being worthy of the supplement, then you have to pay for your inclusion. But the selection criteria has already been established, and that's the key difference. But one of the selection criteria, Simon, is yeah. paying. 
well, no, no, we've made the selection already, I suppose. That's the, <laughs> we've, we've actually got a pool of uh, editorial that we're looking to promote, and I suppose that's the, the, the key distinction for us. So if James Halliday rates a wine that may not appear in the supplement, it will appear elsewhere on your site or in your yes. literature. Yeah, and we also don't claim to be comprehensive as well. In, you know, it's wow facts and why it's, it's, it's not saying they're all, um, all the top value wines under $20, that they're all the best ones. We're giving it quite a, a generic name too. Just quickly, does Hardy Grant have these kind of conversations we're having now? Um, we have over the last week since uh, Max's email. Which um, seems indicative, doesn't it? Because it seems everybody in the last week has yeah. been having this conversation in the industry since Max raised it. I think it's a, it has been an important point. I think um, one of the issues that Max did raise about advertorials is quite interesting because I didn't realise that um, other writers, um, freelance journalists, have actually been writing advertorials. Certainly in James Halliday's Wine Companion, we actually use internal writers to do those. Um, and we use our own editors, so we would never kind of try and compromise a, a journalist to write those kind of things. We might throw this open quickly to the audience and get a couple of questions. If you have some brief questions that you could throw to our panel, does anyone have anything they'd like to ask the panel or make a, a point about? There's someone over here. Hi, my name's Grove. I work for a distributor. Uh, and this discussion seems like it could be more of a general media discussion. Uh, is it that or is it specific to wine media? Would anyone like to answer that? Well, I'll answer it. Dennis will. It's applicable to all media. The sort of principles and, and problems, particularly the conflict of interest problem we'll be discussing here, is applicable uh, across the board in media to political journalism, where people get cut off the drip if they don't comply, uh, travel writing, motoring reviews, uh, the whole gamut of journalism. Uh, one of the great problems of newsroom management is to try to minimise the risk of what we call capture, where a, a roundsman, say your transport roundsman, becomes so dependent upon a source that they will suppress uh, unfavourable material about them so as not to be cut off. So, no, it applies across the board. I'd also qualify that, though, saying... Well, hang on, Mark. Go for it. I'd also qualify that also saying that... I think there's a murkier, a murkier sphere with wine journalism particularly, and I think Dennis sort of raised that in that there's a, there's a sort of teetering link between core journalist journalists and then opinion makers. Um, I was weaned in journalism and shown a code of ethics and we had ethics classes, etc. Uh, but I think that that's not necessarily apparent when you come through as a writer to become all of a sudden an authority. And I think there's a distinction in wine in that there's a lot of opinion and not a lot of journalism background for most people who are um, writing about wine. That's not to say everybody, because I know there are a number of people who are from journalism backgrounds. Um, but it, it seems that it, it's increasingly murky, and, and to, uh, to kind of support um, uh, an increasingly difficult area to actually make a living from, people are stretching themselves in other directions or creatively working to try and find ways to have a living. We'll take some more questions if they're available um, in a few minutes' time, but I'd like to bring some of this to a close with some, some closing statements, if you like, from various parts of the panel. Uh, Angie Bradbury, you told me on the phone that you think victims are the consumers. Sorry, I'll say that again. Angie, you told me on the phone that consumers are the victims in all this. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, I mean, victim is probably a pretty harsh word, but I think that the, the fact of the matter is this conversation does need to be had and it's great that it is and it's great looking at the Twitter feed, you know, the number of different opinions and everything that are coming around it. But one of the issues, I suppose, is that when you read a book review, there are people say this book is fantastic and this book is rubbish. Restaurant reviews say this restaurant is fantastic, this restaurant is rubbish and consumers get this feeling and this sentiment between good and bad and therefore they're reading reviews, movie reviews, book reviews to make decisions about well I think that's rubbish or I think that's great. When do you ever read a review of a wine that says this is rubbish? That was the worst salad or experience. I, you know, and, and, and I think... Um, and I'm not saying that across the board, and of course these are very blanket statements and in not a lot of time to go through you know, a lot of the individual examples, but on the whole, it's a, very pos it's, it's a positive dialogue. So what needs to change? What do you want to see happen? Well, I, I think that the finger's been pointed in some respects back to WCA to do that, you mm. know, to do some of that. And well, Dennis has suggested a code of conduct. 
Well, you know, I think we, we have got a... Co we, from WCA's perspective, we've got a code of conduct about what we think makes a great communicator because we run the Wine Communicator Awards. But it is more gen probably more general and doesn't really deal with a lot of these particular issues. But So what I would be taking back to my board and where I would be talking to my members about is, is that, you know, is that something that the industry would like to see us pursue? It's not about WCA to stand up on high and say, this is what we think. It would be something that was very much, um, you know, contributed to and built up from an you know, from the perspective of our industry, from media's side, from publisher's side and from producer's side, from sommelier's side, from retailer's side. If the industry would like us to do that, and I'm the broad church of our industry, from WCA's perspective, we'd take that on. Just quickly tell people what the debate topic is at your national conference. Uh, that blind tasting isn't worth the paper it's wrapped in. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Muller, what do you think the industry needs to do if it's not going to be mistrusted by the consumers it serves? I think they have to uh, make those disclosures that I talked about, I, and I think that's just fundamental. Uh, and I really do think that having some sort of consensual code of ethics, particularly around this conflict of, issue, of interest issues, would help people. It, it doesn't leave the likes of Mike and Max out in this kind of relativist jungle where what's right is what they think is okay on the day. May I say also that um, there were some other examples we wanted to raise in this forum here today, but because of threats of legal action, we've decided not to do that. But I think that shows that there's a lot of people's reputations at stake when it comes to some of the issues we're touching on. Simon, as a publisher, do you think there is an issue? Um, no, I, I think actually the, the code of conduct discussion is a really valid one, actually. Um, and um, I'd be keen to probably talk to James about that and see where he would uh, like to take that. But just generally, I think from a consumer perspective, if I put my consumer hat on, there doesn't seem to be a clamouring for this kind of uh, discussion. Um, and also, I think, when you look at the wine industry, and I thought Dan Sims' introduction earlier today was really quite interesting, is that I think um, um, when I look outside of uh, the wine industry, is that... Um, they would love the information that's available, um, like authority figures like Halliday, like Jancis Robinson, like Hugh and Hook, to guide them through the consumer journey. Um, you know, it's and that's that contract of trust, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the wine industry really does benefit from the kind of vibrant, independent, authoritative journalism that's already here. Max Allen, this is where we began with you, now we're back with you. Has this session been a step in the right direction? I hope so. <laughs> Uh, as I say, I just wanted to get this all off my chest because I've been worrying about these things for a long time uh, and, and now I have. I promise not to talk about it for at least a week. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think the, the, moving on from here, what the thing that interests me is uh, the traditional media is, is under threat from digital media and from a, a fracturing of, of medias. Um, and the one thing that may ensure sustainability of the wine media is that we retain our credibility and integrity. And that's why this worries me, because I think that standards need to be maintained so that those people who are going out there into the world and saying, I, I have an opinion on something and I would like you to, to trust my, my opinion, I'd like you to take my opinion on board, must have credibility. And if we don't, then they will, we, will be, we will be shoved aside in favour of easy, free content. And, and peer review. And it's already happening. I, I saw a winery the other day, rather than send its new samples, uh, samples of its new wines out to the wine media, it's sending, it out to it, sending the wines out to its customers to review and then posting those reviews on its website, most of which I'm sure will be very favourable and glowing. Um, but how will you distinguish in this, this digital world between favourable customer-supplied reviews and theoretically independent comment? And thereby hangs another session. I'd like to thank Max Allen, Mike Benny, Philip Rich, Dennis Muller, Angie Bradbury and Simon McEwen for their honesty and their insights. And a big thank you too to Wine Day Out and Dan Sims for letting us in the door. You can download this audio from the RN First Bite website unless our lawyers say we can't. So thank you very much for coming.